Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Georges Benjamin, um, and I'm the chair of the um, uh, Committee for the Analysis to Enhance the Effectiveness of the Federal Quarantine Station Network based on lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I have a formal statement that I need to meet um, and read at all of our public sessions. I certainly wanna welcome everyone to this open session of the committee's um, first meeting. This is the third iteration uh, of that um, open meeting. Um, I wanna note this is an open on the record information gathering session. That is the committee is in the process of assembling materials that it will examine and discuss in the course of making its findings, conclusions, and recommendations. Therefore, I ask everyone here today to be extremely mindful of the fact that the committee has made no conclusions and that it would be a mistake for anyone to leave here today thinking otherwise. Comments made by individuals, including members of the committee, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or the academies. Now, this is the first of approximately four, five, um, plan full committee meetings. Um, and some of these meetings may include public sessions, which we will have the opportunity to hear from experts in the field. Committee will deliberate thoroughly before writing this draft report. And moreover, once the draft report is written, it must go through a rigorous review of experts who are anonymous to the committee. And the committee must then respond to this review with appropriate revisions and adequately satisfy the academy's report review committee and the chair of the National Research Council before it is considered an NRC report. So we have a ways to go. The expected report release is May, 2022, and further information on the study, including future meetings can be found on the project website. Now the open session today provides an opportunity for the sponsor of the study to of course address the committee and describe the context and reasoning that went into the committee's statement of tasks so that we can better understand the scope and purpose of this study. And after hearing from the sponsor, um, there will be a short break and a speaker session on vaccine um, activity. Now, during the Q&A session and discussion, the committee questions and comments will take priority, but the public can submit comments to the study email address listed on the project website. And of course, this meeting is being recorded. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers of this session from the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine, uh, Nina Mariano, who's the Chief of the Immigrant, Refugee, and Migrant Health Branch. Emily, is it Emily Jantis, the lead of domestic team for the Immigrant, Refugee, and Migrant Health Branch. Edgar, Edgar uh, Montesero, who's a Senior Epidemiologist for the Southwest Border Migrant Health Task Force and Alfonso Rodriguez Leons, who's the epidemiologist for the Southwest Border Migrant Health Task Force. And these speakers will provide various aspects of the CDC's role in immigrant refugee and migrant health. So with that, let me turn it over to Nina. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nina Miranda. I'm the branch chief of the Immigrant Refugee and Migrant Health Branch at CDC. And I'm uh, pleased to be presenting to you today along with Alfonso, uh, Drew Posey, and Emily Gentes. We had a speaker replacement. Um, I'll be covering most of Dr. Monterosso's slides and Drew will be uh, presenting a little bit about farm worker health. Next slide, please. So today I'm gonna to be talking um, about, principally about our COVID-19 response in refugee populations and in migrant agricultural workers. I'll be spending a couple of minutes at the very beginning talking about our quote unquote peacetime activities, uh, our routine, routine activities in the branch and how they were dr dramatically changed by the pandemic. And then I will end the presentation by talking about some of our uh, um, non-routine migration activities, including unaccompanied children at the Southern border and the most recent uh, arrival of Afghan evacuees uh, on our shores in August of this year. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a slide we show uh, all the time. I just wanted to give this to you as a snapshot. I mean, immigrant, refugee, migrant health branch, refugee features very prominently in our programming. Uh, we track, of course, the arrivals of all of the US bound refugees. Um, and this is the picture of the refugee arrivals in the fiscal year 2021. Um, we were slated to receive 15,000 
uh, which was determined by the previous administration, and we uh, made it to about 11,454 people. Uh, the majority of our arrivals were from the Democratic Re Republic of the Congo. So shortly after the administration changed, um, the allocation was bumped up from 15,000 to 625, and then most recently has been bumped up again to 125,000. We uh, know we will be very busy in the coming year welcoming uh, new arrivals, um, and we look forward to that opportunity. Next slide. So just a little snapshot of what we, what we did prior to 2020. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of things we are very proud of. We have come a long, long way in the, what we call the continuum of care from overseas to domestic as regards uh, refugees, refugee health and immigrant health. So a couple of our hallmark um, contributions were in 2007, we changed our guidance around tuberculosis um, and added a requirement uh, that all incoming refugees and immigrants would be required to have TB cultures and directly observe, observe therapy, which really um, contributed to uh, a um, decline in um, TB TB cases popping up positive after arrival here in the United States because they've been so carefully tracked and observed and cared for overseas. This was followed um, by the uh, development in 2012 of a, a very significant um, overseas vaccination program for refugees. Refugees are not required to be vaccinated, whereas immigrants are. Uh, so this vaccination program, which is voluntary, was put in place in 2012 as a shared agreement between CDC and the Department of State. Uh, we provide 11 ACIP recommended vaccines and treatment for soil transmitted um, helmets and malaria. Uh, this has really been a tremendous boon uh, to preventing outbreaks, preventing uh, the stopping of movement from people overseas uh, who might have been involved in an outbreak uh, and certainly contributes to getting school children, uh, refugee children here in the United States into school quicker because they're well vaccinated by the time they arrive. We have been doing ongoing training for physicians who conduct the exams of immigrants um, and refugees both overseas and here in the United States. Here in the United States they're called civil surgeons. In 2015 we developed uh, something called the Centers of Excellence for Refugee Health, which is uh, the health departments of Colorado and Minnesota, serving as a, uh, the leaders in a network uh, of states that uh, work together to promote refugee health through better surveillance, better education, and training for clinicians. Um, another big hallmark in 2018 was uh, another shared activity between us and the Department of State for the development of an electronic a data transfer system to take the medicals that were being collected from refugees and immigrants overseas uh, to transfer them electronically to CDC so that we could very quickly send them on to the health departments in the locations where they were arriving so that health departments could facilitate their ongoing care. We also completed a study of the feasibility of overseas treatment for latent TB in immigrants in Vietnam and are hoping actually to do that again, similar study uh, with refugees in um, Tanzania this year. And then a longstanding uh, objective of our branch is to uh, tap into high risk populations that are not covered by our cur current guidance. We currently um, have a regulatory responsibility to do uh, examinations overseas for uh, immigrants and refugees, but not for certain classes of non-immigrant visa holders, such as students and workers. So this um, uh, initiative of ours was planned to really uh, reach out and uh, sort of grab this very big population of visitors and um, ensure that they would be properly screened for TB. Next slide, please. So in January of 2020, <laughs> the big blue X is showing that these activities, they did not ground to a halt, but they certainly were diverted. Um, all of these longstanding programs, um, you know, helped us uh, pivot into this COVID response. Um, and, you know, if these investments have really paid off, but um, in many ways, they also, uh, the routine parts of these activities have slowed down to focus on COVID. 
Next slide. So the next little set of slides that I'm gonna be showing you are how we have uh, taken those tools and trainings and educations and policies and turn them into uh, something we could switch on for COVID. So this, I mentioned continuity of care. Again, this is for refugees. Um, refugees are required to have an overseas, and immigrants are required to have an overseas medical exam. Uh, so overseas, we um, ensure that during that encounter with the physician that refugees and immigrants um, have the opportunity to receive COVID vaccination uh, before they are before they actually depart to get onto an airplane to come to the United States. Refugees are then screened again um, for signs and symptoms. And of course they are tested to ensure that they are not um, infected with COVID uh, and therefore would not be allowed to, to board the airplane. Um, once they arrive in the United States at the beginning of the pandemic, we were actually giving them a refugee welcome booklet on arrival so that they would understand the myriad complexities of um, state-based home monitoring and COVID isolation, COVID quarantine, and uh, all of the other uh, mitigations that were necessary, such as mask use. Um, this intervention was moved upstream and was uh, actually, we moved it overseas so that the booklet could be given before the refugees ever left their countries of origin. And finally, the domestic medical exam is something that all refugees um, are uh, in, entitled to. It's part of their health benefits. Uh, it's normally scheduled within 90, within 90 days after arrival. In our COVID guidance, we recommended that refugees be seen within 14 days of arrival and that they be uh, offered the opportunity to receive COVID vaccination if they did not already receive it overseas. Next slide, please. Oh, so here's a little bit of editorial comment. We have a few editorial comments that we'd like the committee to consider. Um, I mentioned that while we have this very comprehensive vaccination program, it's a costly program, and there is no uh, sustainable line item funding for that program. And think about all of the benefits that that program achieves and how far along it brings the refugees in terms of their health by the time they get to the United States. Yet, yet we do not have uh, a, a funding line for this. It's put together at the end of the year uh, due to the commitment of our division director and the commitment of our center to help fund this, uh, but it just goes year to year. It's a cost share between ourselves and the Department of State, and that really remains a vulnerability. If we you know, don't have money one year because there wasn't enough money left at the end of the year, then the refugees would not be able to be vaccinated. Next slide, please. So we entered the pandemic in January of 2020. And, you know, there was, of course, a huge amount of activity in our division uh, focused on the ports of arrival, of, on screening for COVID, of travelers and, and that sort of thing. But, uh, there was not a particular focus on refugees and immigrants um, until April of 2020, when it, we began to realize that mm, there were a lot of uh, outbreaks occurring in the United States, COVID outbreaks occurring on farms and among food processing in food processing plants in the United States. And the, th the single overriding theme in those outbreaks were that most of the affected populations were either recent refugee or recently arrived refugees or migrants. Uh, and this is our population. These are the people that we exist to serve and are responsible for. So uh, we noticed a lot of gaps. We noticed that there um, tended not to be uh, uh, a real thorough attempt to obtain race and ethnicity data, country of birth data on a lot of the surveillance uh, forms that were being used at the time um, that, uh, you know, without um, access to interpreters, that uh, research opportunities would be lost uh, for the ability to include refugees, immigrants, and migrants in some of these research opportunities. Um, we felt that we lacked a lot of information, lacked a lot of information about who was crossing the border, uh, for what reasons were they crossing the border, say between the United States and Mexico. We also realized that most of our materials 
while we are very proud of what we produce at CDC, could have could have used a lot of improvement in being more linguistically and culturally appropriate for our refugee immigrant audiences. Um, and then also the, the way you would go about doing things like contact tracing um, in refugee and immigrant populations has to be uh, culturally sensitive and culturally appropriate. And we, you know, a lot of the things that we were doing needed a lot of tweaking and reconsideration for the unique populations that we work with. So out of that was born something called the Globally Mobile Populations Team within our um, division's task, COVID-19 task force response. Next slide, please. So this Globally Mobile Populations Team, it was the first time a team like this had been formed within our division during a response to focus on health equity um, of, of you know, refugees and immigrants. They played a very prominent uh, you know, role in this COVID pan pandemic, and we realized the importance of being sensitive um, and supporting this population. So here is some of the materials um, that have examples of some of the materials that were produced. Uh, we, we did, Alfon Alfonso in particular, started to begin to look at uh, you know, where were the outbreaks occurring in the United States and then overlaying them with uh, data that we had on refugee populations and immigrant populations and populations such as farm workers. Um, and of course, we started to see that in many cases, those outbreaks and those populations overlaid quite nicely on these maps. We had a number of other activities that you can see down the right-hand side. But I think one of the, one of the you know, main contributions of this team was to serve as a focal point within the response for health equity around refugees and, and migrants. Um, and we have been very successful in the COVID response with obtaining funding to fund some, some very impressive projects, which I'll be talking about and um, my co-presenters will also be talking about. So next slide. Well, this is one of them. Uh, this is called the National Resource Center for Refugees, Immigrants, and Migrants, which was born out of the COVID response. Um, it's been up and running for about a year now. It is run out of the University of Minnesota uh, with money going to uh, the International Rescue Committee and to um, NACHO for uh, a number of really, really outstanding projects. Money that has gone to NACHO is now funding 23 demonstration projects in 23 different states with 23 different populations uh, showing best practices for how to reach out to and work with uh, RIM populations. And we're very excited about um, this, this center. Their website is listed at the bottom and they have all kinds of incredible tools uh, for uh, vaccine, overcoming vaccine hesitancy, which is of course a real issue in, this, in these populations. Um, so please do get visit this site when you have an opportunity. Next slide. This is just an example of uh, some of the messages. They've done a lot of testing with different populations and you know wanted to promote very positive messages about vaccination. And this is one on the left that they came up with that you know, vaccination is hope um, and to make, give it a, a positive connotation and uh, around family and uh, you know, wellness. And um, these are things that they have tested very, very carefully with these populations. So um, please do visit this website. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. I, I did not want to leave the subject of COVID, COVID-19 response in refugees and immigrants without telling you about um, our offices in Africa and Asia. We have senior epidemiologists and locally employed staff in Kenya and Thailand since, 20, since, since 2000, 2006 uh, and in 2014, the, there was something called the Border Health Team that uh, began in response to the Ebola outbreaks in 2014. Um, so these offices and this team have really enhanced our ability to understand uh, what's going on internationally uh, around crossing of borders and how we can help uh, other countries um, 
help themselves as regards mobile populations, which of course do include refugees and immigrants, but also include my, many migrants moving back and forth for economic reasons. Um, so the, uh, the activities are uh, part certainly to fulfill our regulatory responsibility around US bound immigrants and refugees. They also uh, support uh, outbreaks, uh, they support refugee camps in their regions um, and they provide uh, technical uh, assistance, particularly the border health team on public health issues that impact mobile populations um, and uh, improving the capability of public health staff at ports of entry to detect and monitor um, highly um, communicable diseases. Next slide, just spend a couple of minutes talking about Thailand. I thought you'd be interested to know that we monitor nine camps uh, along the Thai-Myanmar border where we do take uh, US bound refugees. This Thailand has been a country from uh, where we have been bringing refugees for many, many years. Um, and we work with NGOs that are listed on this slide and coordinate around the activities that are listed on this slide. Next slide, please. And um, we wanted to let you know, just teeny a little bit about what's going on in uh, vaccination with refugees. Uh, among those 90,000 people, uh, only uh, around 10% have re received their first day dose and an even smaller percentage has received their second dose. We understand through something called the COVAX humanitarian buffer, which is a large a bolus of vaccine that has been donated for humanitarian populations that uh, the COVAX um, program has been approved for camps for refugees in Thailand. So that is very exciting somewhere in the next few months. I think there will be a lot more vaccine headed towards Thailand. And here we also talk a little bit about some of the other countries in the region and um, the status of vaccine in refugees. Next slide. We also have our program in Africa based out of uh, Nairobi, Kenya in the CDC office there. Uh, they do similar activities with US bound refugees. Um, they have, are doing some very interesting work supporting the Ministry of Health in mobile apps uh, to track COVID in um, mobile uh, workers like truckers. And of course they also have a program for um, COVID um, vaccination and testing status in arriving air travelers and uh, working closely with NGOs in camps to improve COVID uh, testing capacity and vaccination availability. Next slide, please. Okay, now I'm gonna to switch topics one more time and get into some of our non-routine um, migration responses. And this is always a very, very large one um, involving unaccompanied children surging at the Southern border in March of this past year, March of 2021, it was um, the largest influx of children coming across the southern border in many, many years. I think we've been working with um, the Office of Refugee Resettlement on unaccompanied children responses for close to 25 years. And this is the largest one in history, um, you know, double the two previous events that are shown on this, uh, on this chart. Uh, approximately 18,000 children uh, coming across just through the first half, I'm sorry, 114,000 children coming across just in the first half of the fiscal year, this past year. Next slide, please. So just a real uh, quick glimpse of how we, how we and the other org agencies coordinate around unaccompanied children. Um, when children are apprehended, um, they are processed through Customs and Border Patrol. They travel to uh, an ORR identified shelter. Um, that transportation can be by air or it more frequently by ground transport provided by Department of Homeland Security. Uh, they are, in the case of this particular outbreak, some, we did, there was something brand new that was never done before since the small shelters of the Office of Re Refugee Resettlement were quite overwhelmed and could, did not have the capacity, the bed space for these children. Um, the US government quickly reverted to uh, opening emergency intake shelters 
Um, at one point, there were up to 14 of them operating across the country in various places that could be leased quickly, like uh, civic centers and um, conference, uh, large conference centers, uh, uh, the site of the Los Angeles County Fair was taken over for, uh, in one case, in Pomona, California. Um, and uh, so these are places that could house uh, Fort Bliss is a military base that was uh, scheduled to house as many as uh, 5,000 children at one point. Uh, so these children would come, be able to, uh, of course, have their immediate needs taken care of, be tested for COVID, uh, at, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, but finally, after a two to a three week stay, would be uh, re hopefully reunited with their sponsors and moved either to their family or to a permanent ORR shelter. Next slide, please. So um, what did CDC do in this response? Uh, our mission, uh, was to support the Office of Refugee Resettlement. You know, here we have a complex humanitarian disaster with a pandemic running through it. Um, so clearly our major, our major mission there was to work on COVID-19 mitigation. Just thinking about how to do quarantine in a facility that is a, essentially an open space, like a San Diego, San Diego Convention Center, a wide open space. How do you do quarantine in a facility like that? Uh, where do you do isolation? Where do you send the children that actually are, that are sick with COVID? And thinking all of that through, uh, working uh, with uh, not only the children, but of course the staff um, and ensuring that everyone was using the proper social distancing and wearing masks, uh, hand hygiene, uh, et cetera. So uh, we sent teams of deployers uh, over, we still have uh, deployers out there. I, I mentioned at one point we had 14 shelters operating. We are now down to three shelters. Um, two are for unaccompanied children from the Southern border and one is actually for Afghan unaccompanied children. So we have really reduced the number of children, but um, you know, still standing by to support the Office of Refugee Resettlement should the numbers um, increase in the spring. Over, uh, next slide, please. Just to give you an idea, this is just you know, a wall of blue. <laughs> These are all the children that came through from um, May through October. I think we hit our peak in May. Um, and um, have been bumping up and down since, but I think right now we're down to fewer than 2,000 children uh, at these um, three shelters combined. Next slide, please. And just to give you an idea of some of the data that we uh, are routinely presented uh, to leadership of the agencies, uh, this is just a chart showing the proportion of the COVID positive children at uh, all the facilities. Um, and I think the blue bars are showing the proportion that tested positive. Um, and then the green line is showing the percent change. And I think the current percent positive at the sites that remain is about 7.6% positivity for COVID. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to my co-presenter, um, Alfonso rodriguez Lanes. Thank you very much, uh, Nina, and good morning, everyone from uh, San Diego. It's an honor for me to be uh, giving this uh, presentation or participating in this presentation to this uh, uh, committee. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about one of the important migrant population that Nina has mentioned, like cultural workers in, uh, in the US. There is an estimated 2.5 million agricultural workers, high agricultural workers. They include uh, several hundred thousand that come to the US every year with temporary visas to work seasonally in the, in the US. Uh, from the beginning of the pandemic, they were considered essential critical infrastructure uh, workers to ensure the, the food supply in the U.S. And thanks to their you know, very hard work uh, and uh, sacrifices, we all were able to have enough supplies of uh, fresh products in our uh, supermarkets. But at the same time, uh, because of that, they were uh, required to work. Uh, they were a higher risk for COVID-19. Uh, they, uh, because, because of a compounded number of uh, risk factors, uh, they typically work in overcrowded work uh, conditions. Uh, many of them uh, have overcrowded housing, overcrowded travel, both uh, domestically to go to different 
farms or part of the countries to work, but also internationally. Again, those who come from Mexico, Central America, by bus to go anywhere in the uh, farms across the whole uh, U.S. Immigration status is an important risk factor. The majority are non-U.S. citizens, many with temporary visas or no legal status in the U.S. That creates a lot of uh, limitations in terms of access to services and uh, benefits that we, most of us had during the, uh, during the pandemic and also fear and distrust and uh, potential for abuse from employers and, uh, and others. Uh, the majority experience uh, poverty, uh, very, very high proportion of limited English proficient uh, individuals, most are foreign born, uh, uh, even though the majority have been living in the US for many decades. And also one of the lowest uh, uh, insurance uh, access to healthcare barriers and very, very low uh, uh, insurance uh, uh, proportion of those with health insurance. We also experienced uh, many multiple gaps during the, uh, uh, during the pandemic first, even though there have been many uh, multiple reports in the news about outbreaks and death uh, among farm workers uh, and also barriers to information, testing, treatment and vaccination uh, documented in some in a limited number of local studies. We have big gaps in terms of the data. We don't really know right now the, the actual uh, burden of COVID-19 among farm workers. And one of the main reasons, because we don't collect COVID-19, uh, sorry, we do not connect uh, occupational data in our, in our national, uh, state and local surveillance systems. Also, we know that there are multiple organizations serving agricultural workers in the country, but they are uh, uncoordinated. They don't have coordinated strategies. And also most of them have limited capacity. There are many, many uh, very small uh, uh, local organizations with uh, limited personnel and capacity to, to reach out to this large, and uh, frequently harder to reach population. Next slide, please. So in response to that, we did for the first time, I believe, and uh, uh, in the CDC, we established this very comprehensive partnership with a national network of farm workers serving organizations. This is a five-year cooperative agreement. We have been able to secure, uh, our team was able to secure and lead uh, the CDC efforts uh, to secure a uh, funding for the first uh, two years. And uh, uh, the, uh, the agreement, the project is led by the National Center for Farm Worker Health, one of the most historic uh, groups, organizations in the country serving farm workers. Uh, but the network is, uh, uh, is form of uh, many multiple local community-based organizations, community health centers, local health departments and employer organizations across the country. As you can see here, uh, 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 the basic maps and the, and the right. Uh, and this is a done in very close collaboration with the different task forces and, uh, and, and technical support from the CDC. Uh, the objectives are to strengthen the organization's emergency response coordination and outreach capacity. Again, also to do it in a more coordinated way uh, and to enhance the education access and adoption of COVID-19, preventing measures uh, among farm workers and also employers. Employees are critical to be able to, to open the door to, to, to their workers and the farms in the, in the world locations. Next slide, please. So this uh, uh, cooperative agreement includes multiple uh, uh, outreach and education and other strategies. These are just some of the uh, kind of broader categories. Uh, we have been focused uh, in developing or adapting educational materials in multiple languages and formats. Like uh, Nina mentioned, uh, in the CDC at the federal level, we tend to do mostly uh, printed uh, infographics. Uh, we know that for most of this population, they prefer to have short videos or, or PSA audios for which they have greater, uh, you know, great access. Also, even though the majority of the farm workers are from Mexico, uh, they speak Spanish, but there is an increasing uh, percentage of uh, workers from indigenous communities from Latin America who speak indigenous languages, very different cultures, uh, very discriminated both in their countries of birth and also here in the, in the U.S., even among other uh, immigrants. Uh, and again, need communication uh, in their uh, actual languages. There are also Haitian workers, uh, et cetera. So we have been developing materials in those languages too. I think that one of the, uh, uh, I like more about this partnership is that most of the funding, I'm the technical monitor, uh, most of the funding has gone to local organizations where the funding is needed to the field. And these are the organizations who have the trust and the ability to reach out to the, uh, to the farm workers. So we have been funding 43 local organizations in the first year, uh, providing trainings and technical assistance. 
We have, all, we have also conducted a national radio and social media campaign in Spanish and indigenous languages with three large uh, uh, ethnic uh, media uh, organizations in the US, the largest ones, in the geographic areas where we have, been, uh, we have information that there are large concentrations of farm workers. We have also a specific project for these uh, temporary seasonal workers that I mentioned to you that are very important for us, the H2A seasonal workers. And in year number two that we have started, we're going to be conducting not only outreach to them specifically, but also outreach uh, uh, in Mexico through partner organization there. And finally, we're conducting local rapid farm worker community assessment to try to address some of the gaps in data and also to, also to guide us in our uh, development of materials uh, and trainings to, uh, uh, to address the needs, the knowledge and attitudes and practices of the workers the local, uh, in those local communities, and also to give us a sense uh, to come up with an estimate of vaccination coverage uh, and barriers in those communities. Next slide. So this is just uh, some uh, numbers from uh, only partial of the first year of the funding. As you can see here, a, a very significant uh, number of uh, uh, individuals, uh, farm workers and family members were reached directly, either in face-to-face -face or digitally, 670,000. Uh, testing, COVID-19 testing referrals, about 27,000. Other referrals to health and social services, very important for those communities. Even though they produce our food, they frequently uh, experience hunger and lack of uh, access to, uh, to good quality food and other social services, 70,000. Uh, PPE is a major lack. Uh, they, many of them don't have access, were not provided with masks or hand sanitizers, and they had to pay for them uh, to go to work uh, and uh, every day. Uh, and obviously, if you're living in poverty, this is an uh, additional expense that you need, to, uh, you need to pay for. And finally, uh, uh, directly uh, through these projects, 61,000 farm workers and community members uh, were received at least the first dose uh, of the vaccine. And that was only through uh, events uh, that were organized by our project. Next slide, please. And now I would like to ask my colleague, Dr. Drew Posse, to tell you on a specific project that he led uh, in Mexico uh, of testing of uh, these uh, H2 agricultural workers. Uh, Drew, please. All right, uh, thank you, Alfonso. And it's wonderful to be with you all today. And as Alfonso said, I'm going to talk to you about uh, one specific testing pilot program we did within Mexico that we were very excited about. This involved one of the agricultural groups that Alfonso mentioned, specifically workers granted an H-2A visa. This is a very important agricultural group. The Department of State issues these temporary work visas to approximately 300,000 people per year, 90% 90, 90 of which, excuse me, are originate from Mexico. So we uh, designed and worked to implement a voluntary pilot testing program to try to learn more about the perceptions about uh, uptake, interest in having COVID testing, as well as to learn more about insights into the results uh, and the rates in this group. Testing was done between February and April, so prior to the advent of widespread availability of vaccines. We are fortunate to have 1,195 workers be tested. Only 15 or 1.3% were positive. The map to your right shows the locations within Mexico of where the positive workers were coming from. The average turnaround time of testing was 31 hours from specimen collection to reporting back to the uh, worker. We measured this because of concerns of any COVID interventions potentially slowing the flow of workers from Mexico into the United States. As many of you may know, the timing of the workers arrival on farms is extremely up to the minute uh, so that workers arrive at the, the perfect time to harvest the crops. Fortunately, a uh, majority of the workers reported that their employer was going to assume responsibility for housing uh, in Mexico if they had a positive test result. Next slide. So this work, while we were very excited to do it, helped uh, underscore some of the issues we're trying to face and that Alfonso is working on and also some themes coming up in our other work over the past year. This is another population that is essential. Uh, we were very concerned about reports of outbreaks on farms and wanting to do what we could. 
as Alfonso has been discussing, to protect this population and ensure the U.S. food supply. But testing was not required for entry on land borders at that time. And we again ran into the fact that there were no regulations in place to mandate testing or uh, vaccination as a part of a visa requirement for this group. So we worked hard for the pilot to try to learn more information to help inform uh, future endeavors. Over. Yeah, next slide, please. So Alfonso Rodriguez here again. Uh, uh, so, so the question is, so, so now what, right? We have uh, established this uh, strong national network with uh, uh, agricultural workers serving organizations that have been critical for the CDC to be able to outreach and, 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 uh, and provide the message and, uh, and, and, uh, and other essential services to fund workers across the country. Uh, state and local health department, we have been receiving the continuous uh, uh, request for assistance from our state and local partners. What do we do with fund workers? What do we do with, uh, with migrant fund workers? Uh, DGNQ, our division, has taken the lead in addressing this issue across the, the, the agency, across the response. We are collaborating very closely with other task forces. We have a fund worker interest group. But the question is how, how do we uh, maintain this partnership? So uh, the, if the next pandemic, uh, we don't have to start restart from zero. This is not something you can you know, turn on and off, this type of, uh, of collaborations. And uh, so the goal that we have for, the, uh, for this year and the, hopefully the continuation of the, the, this five-year COAC, we still need to look for additional funding for years uh, three, four, and five, uh, both financial and, and technical support. We're looking to strengthen the national network, particularly focusing on a further engagement with employers and local uh, uh, jurisdictions, addressing the data gaps. How can we start better collecting uh, surveillance, occupational data in our surveillance system, or to have uh, uh, at least one strong surveillance system that captures uh, information about farm worker and other uh, food production uh, uh, workers. And what I think is also, again, the opportunity is to expand or to use this partnership uh, to expand to other emerging uh, disease issues that are uh, uh, that these uh, workers uh, experience disparities or have higher, higher risks. Environmental disaster, they always have higher risk for environmental disasters too, and also to, to be better prepared for future public health uh, emergencies. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention. And now I'm going to be asking my colleague, uh, Emily Jantes, to, to follow with the next, uh, the next slide and the next uh, section of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Alfonso. So I'm um, honored to be able to talk with you today about our work with Operation Allies Welcome. Uh, this will be the last topic area before I send it back to Nina for a wrap up. Um, so as many of you know, on August 29th, President De uh, Biden directed uh, the Department of Health, uh, Homeland Security to lead the implementation efforts to support our vulnerable Afghans. Um, these are those that were uh, working alongside the U.S. government in Afghanistan for the past two decades, and because of that association, uh, face security concerns. And so this support was really to help them safely resettle into the United States. So DHS stood up a unified coordination group, or a UCG, uh, to coordinate um, all the efforts across the governmental agencies. And this has really been an all, uh, all hands on deck approach. Um, so the UCG has coordinated the implementation of the initial immigrant processing, COVID testing and isolation of COVID positive individuals, as well as the medical services and screening. And that's really where our group has um, stepped in to assist. So this support has included the initial processing at the um, what we call the safe haven sites or the U.S. military bases across the country uh, that are currently housing uh, the evacuated Afghans um, before they're connected with resettlement agencies for placement across the United States. Um, all of this is not done in a vacuum, however, with the UCG working in partnership with the state and local health departments, not only in the um, states where the safe havens are located, uh, but also in the resettlement sites. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, part of our work is helping with the different scenarios uh, with the different visa classifications for the evacuated Afghans. And so um, just to give a little bit of background on that, um, the special immigrant visa applicants is a population we've been working with for a number of years. Um, these are, again, the Afghan nationals who are employed 
uh, on, by or on behalf of the US government. So these are our translators, our interpreters, and their immediate families. When these folks are processed into the United States, they will actually will receive a, a immigrant visa, uh, but they are eligible for domestic uh, refugee resettlement and placement benefits from both um, the Department of State as well as uh, the Office of Refugee Resettlement within HHS. Um, the second group is the humanitarian parolees, and, and that <laughs> term is unfortunate. It's it's not a criminal classification as is seen here in the United States, but is actually a, a temporary status where individuals applying for this um, parole can obtain uh, two years of entry into the United States. Likely, these folks will uh, go through the asylum pathway after their process, but their initial um, entry into the United States is under this humanitarian parolee status. And then we also do have special immigrant parolees to mix, <laughs> mix and match there a little bit, but these are individuals that are pending applications for SIV status. Next slide, please. So where all this matters is where our medical screening comes in. So for the SIVs, they are actually, because they're obtaining that immigrant visa, would go through our full civil surgeon exam. So at these military bases, we did have our SIV applicants completing that full immigration exam um, at the, the bases, which included a history and physical, the vaccination, age-appropriate vaccinations, uh, ACIP recommended vaccinations, tuberculosis screening, as well as syphilis and gonorrhea screening, uh, screening for uh, Hansen's disease, as well as um, a mental health and substance abuse uh, screening as well. For our parolees, technically when they come into the United States, there isn't uh, medical screening that typically happens, but for this particular situation, because of the, the number of Afghans that we were bringing in, uh, as well as the coordinated response, um, DHS had as a condition of their parole into the United States that these, these individuals would need to have a history and physical exam, vaccinations, and tuberculosis screening. And this was something that we advised DHS would be, um, would be a good uh, way forward. Uh, next slide, please. And that's uh, because uh, we all know that um, congregate settings can be a hotbed for communicable diseases. And, and that is actually what uh, we did encounter. Um, on September 14th, we did uh, halt movement into the United States from our overseas locations where our Afghan evacuees were um, being housed um, because we did have a number of measles cases that had happened overseas as well as domestically at our safe havens. And so we stopped movement of the Afghans into the United States so that we could do mass vaccination campaigns both overseas at what we were calling our lily pad locations, um, as well as our safe haven sites here in the US. Um, and after that vaccination, um, having a, a hold for 21 days to en enable case management, contact tracing and outbreak control. Uh, we did get an executive order to add measles to the list of quarantinable communicable diseases. Uh, luckily, we did not need to enact those, those quarantine orders um, as all of our Afghan evacuees voluntarily stayed on the bases for that 21-day hold. Um, we have had other communicable diseases diagnosed on our um, our sites. And so we at CDC have been involved with that, uh, with the control of um, those uh, communicable diseases, including mumps, pertussis, varicella, hepatitis A, COVID-19. Um, but as I mentioned before, we were able with the uh, conditions of parole, as well as the medical screening exams to get a head start on, on the vaccinations by providing at least one of the age appropriate vaccinations, MMR vaccine, uh, polio vaccine, vaccine, um, expanded age categories for those two uh, particular vaccines, as well as COVID vaccination. So um, a lot of these vaccine preventable diseases happened before we could get those vaccinations underway. Um, but uh, we've gotten most of those done now, uh, as most of the screening has been completed at all of the bases. And so that's exciting news. Um, we have seen active tuberculosis, uh, malaria, leishmaniasis, uh, licensed scabies, but in, in those cases and, and where we found that, we have instituted case management, contact tracing, and outbreak control measures um, at the sites. Next slide. So I just want to touch on this with the continuing resolution that was passed um, at, at the end of the fiscal year, so September 30th, October 1st, the, the great news is, is that 
both the SIVs as well as the parolees, uh, the parolees were a new population into this, are eligible for those benefits that I mentioned earlier. So for um, this makes a big difference in terms of health care for, um, for these individuals as the initial ORR benefits do provide um, health benefits after arrival up to eight months um, after after arrival into the United States. So as a part of these benefits, uh, the it says refugee cash, cash assistance, but our SIVs and parolees are eligible now. So uh, refugee is a little bit of a misnomer, but they do receive cash assistance, a matching grant program um, RMA, which is the refugee medical assistance. That's uh, healthcare um, in states that don't have expanded Medicaid. Next slide, please. And finally, it does in, uh, involve also employment assistance, as well as any other specialized program that the local affiliate has determined to be uh, necessary for those resettling in their communities. Next slide, please. So the last thing I just want to mention about um, Operation Allies Welcome is that we have worked towards putting together um, a uh, Afghan resettlement medical screening portal in which we um, are able to send the results of the tuberculosis screening as well as the vaccinations that are done on site at the base to our state and local health departments. Our Afghan evacuees are um, encouraged to take the copies of their medical records with them to their final destinations and the clinics that will be providing care to them with that domestic medical screening that Nina mentioned early on. Um, but we all know that paper medical records can get lost. So at CDC, we've worked to put together a uh, medical screening program or the the portal where we're actually putting in inputting that data into an electronic portal that will be sent sent to our state uh, refugee health coordinators uh, to pass along to the local clinics that will eventually see these uh, Afghan evacuees. Next slide, please. Um, so just as part of Nina's commentaries that she mentioned earlier, you know, part of the, the hurdles that we've overcome uh, with, with this project, and we're still working on some of these, is that, you know, emergency data collection always comes with a, a few hiccups, and we've certainly felt those hiccups along the way. Um, you know, being able to uh, transition on the fly and creating new systems because the, the existing systems are not tweaked in such a way that may ex uh, be readily available to accept new data. Um, and so the medical exam data that was collected was done on, on paper forms at the bases, um, which is not ideal. Usually we'd love to have everything in an electronic medical record, but the way in, in the manner in which the camps were set up in such a, a speedy way, it was neat, necessary to have um, the most ex expeditious way to do that, and that was on paper. So the, then the question became how to get that information to our, our health departments when we really had systems such as eMedical uh, that is authorized for immigrants only and is really a uh, jump started from the overseas process where we normally have our overseas medical exams. So um, starting that midstream with, with uh, having those uh, medical exams done domestically uh, was a bit challenging to try to figure out how can we utilize our existing systems, but also tweak them um, and create workarounds when we needed to, to make sure things were doing being done as quickly as possible. And finally, um, as a federal government, um, we didn't always have, and we don't ha always have the data sharing agreements in place between agencies. And so we're still working those out uh, between uh, USCIS and ourselves. Um, but, you know, that has presented a little bit of a challenge just being able to to being held back timing wise because those didn't already exist. So more to come on this uh, Project Arms. We're really excited to be able to do this, but it's definitely been a little bit of a, a challenge and, and ways to get it set up. But um, the team has really tried to do that and especially with the support of the, the UCG. So I'll turn it back to Nina now. Um, I think that was my last slide. Nina, back to you. Thanks, Emily. I think there's one more slide. Yes. Um, so this represents uh, sort of our thoughts and our experiences. And um, we hope that the committee uh, would want to engage with us on some discussion about this. Um, and then it, towards the very bottom of this slide, we have some questions. Um, uh, so to begin with, uh, you know, we 
work closely with Department of State on uh, immigration uh, regulatory authorities for specifically for immigrants. Um, and, and we found that we were pushed, both pushed to the limits um, and found that we, between our two agencies um, at that time, we could not require that these essential farm workers be vaccinated before entry. So, you know, we, we did everything we could, um, but we, between the agencies, we don't have the regulatory uh, ability to put quickly in place a, a mandate um, within the regulatory scope to, to vaccinate um, these essential workers. We found that we need to focus a lot more on the health of uh, refugee immigrant migrant communities that already live in the US. We have always had a domestic team in our branch, um, but this pandemic has shown us how important it is to not forget about the fact that these people come and if, you know, we usually focus on maybe the first 90 days after they arrive and then say, well, we've done the handover and the state health departments need to just take over. But I think we, we collectively at CDC need to support health departments in supporting um, RIM communities that, that are living long-term in the United States. Um, the importance of having the close relationships prior to the pandemic uh, uh, really did pay off. And now we have, of course, made even some new colleagues and friends with our two big cooperative agreements on the farm workers and the National Resource Center. Um, I mentioned early in this presentation about our frust uh, frustration and real concern about uh, the lack of the sustainable funding for the vaccine program. This is one. This is our hallmark program in our branch um, to protect the health of refugees and protect the health of communities into which they are moving in the United States. And uh, we feel that, you know, attention to a, a permanent line, congressional line item funding would be very, very helpful here. Um, as what Emily just mentioned about data sharing, uh, having all those agreements in peacetime really would facilitate, I think, um, the ability to move more quickly during an emergency. And something that uh, Alfonso alluded to in his set, in his series of slides, you know, we built this fantastic infrastructure around you know, the farm workers and around the uh, rim populations. What's gonna happen when the COVID-19 funding goes away? These health inequities in refugees, immigrants and migrants are not gonna go away simply because it's not about COVID. You know, it's what about influenza? What about tuberculosis? What about, Diabetes. Um, what about all the other things that they also face challenges with? Um, so we're we're starting to ping on the pipeline here in at CDC to engage around this topic. Um, but we are becoming concerned um, that we will lose the gains we've gotten. And then, of course, um, we found in our discussions around the agricultural workers, uh, you know, Mexico clearly is a very big sentence. Ninety-three percent of the U.S. agricultural workers come from Mexico. Uh, so, you know, more collaboration with Mexico on H-2A workers uh, is 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 very important um, to have a program that is um, workable, not just in the face of an emergency, but um, you know, to support the health of these workers outside of an emergency context. And then the question that we struggle with and have this whole outbreak has really, this whole pandemic has really uh, highlighted this, that, you know, what we're pretty clear on refugees, <laughs> we're very clear on immigrants, uh, but we're not so clear on migrants. Um, you know, who should our, what should our migrant scope be? You know, are we talking about the ones, you know, I talked about our overseas programs. You know, we, we do help migrants who live abroad and who will not be coming to the United States. Our programs in Kenya and Thailand are uh, serving a, a lot of uh, health programs, health surveillance programs um, uh, to support migrant populations. Um, so that's one group of people. What about migrants entering the United States from another country, such as the H-2A workers? What about migrants already living in the US? US um, you know, people who are not necessarily from outside the US, but who move frequently, uh, other farm workers, other crop workers, uh, emergency uh, responders, that sort of thing. Um, 
you know, what is our scope and responsibility with that group? And then finally, the question that runs through all of these groups, you know, are we focusing only on documented migrants or should we um, focus on you know, documented versus undocumented? So I will stop there and I thank my co-presenters um, and thank the committee for listening to us uh, now for almost an hour. And um, we'd be very happy to talk with you and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. And thank you, thank you um, all three of you very, very much. Um, so we're gonna open up the session up for Q and A and just wanna remind our public attendees that the, the primary focus of these sessions uh, are for the committee to get their questions answered. But obviously if the public has any questions they can email the project email address listed on the project website um, um, so that they can get their questions in. Um, so I think um, Itza and Stephen, um, I see their hands raised. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the presenters. This was an amazing presentation and I think I have learned a lot today. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I think Nina, Nina already raised a couple of the points I wanted to make and make questions. The first one is about the issue of collaboration. I mean, you have this huge scope of work with very different populations. So which are the different agencies and groups you need to collaborate with? And I wanted to focus in the, in the US-Mexico border. Are you working in some ways with, for example, the, the, the Border Health Commission, the Binational uh, Infectious Diseases Surveillance Group, other groups, or are these groups that work with other branches within the, within the division? And what do you feel your, uh, your role in, this, in these networks should be? Right? So, so how, how could you uh, participate in these very complicated re relationships that are established in the, in the specific case of the, of the US-Mexico border and, and, mm -hmm. and in other parts of the world? The, the second thing is, uh, uh, the, this issue of what types of migrants, immigrants, refugees, etc., are you going to work with, or are, are you? Is it important to work with all of them or not? And I think one one way to answer that question or, or to start thinking about that question will be to to think in terms of uh, what are the groups that are more important for the division's mission or the or your branch's mission. So. What, what is your feeling in that sense? What are your thoughts in that sense? What is more important for, for your mission? And my, my third question is, uh, you, you mentioned the, the issue of health equity, which I think it's, it's very relevant. And how important do you feel health equity is for the, for the mission of, of your branch and of the division? And especially because in this committee, we are tasked with providing recommendations for, for the efficacy of, of the work you do. And I've been wondering what should be the indicators of efficacy. And I I'm, think some sort of indicator of equity should be one of them, but I'm, I don't know if you have thought about that or what do you think about that? Thank you All very right. much, really. All right, let me try to tackle some and I want to invite my co-presenters uh, also to, to respond to parts of these questions. Um, so I'll take your first question about the Southern border and how our division operates. We have a unit called the US-Mexico unit. It's headed by Dr. Kathy Mosier. In fact, Alfonso is out of that unit. Um, it's centered in San Diego. Uh, it has been within our division for a very, very long time. Um, so I think I, I don't wanna put Alfonso on the spot, but maybe I can turn quickly over to Alfonso so he can describe USMU's involvement with the Border Health Commission, uh, et cetera. Um, Alfonso? Well, thank you very much, Nina. Thank you, it's uh, nice to see you. Uh, definitely, we are, we are working, my office is working extremely closely for many, many years with the uh, US Mexico Border Health Commission. Right now we have several projects going on. One is specifically to come up with a dashboard uh, to to visualize the uh, the the health issues disparities and uh, and uh, and the border region of the of the U.S. Mexico in collaboration with our Mexican colleagues, uh, we also have the definitely very close collaboration with the uh, Customs and Border Patrol in uh, in all the land ports uh, of entry, and there is uh, we have an office in Mexico, a CDC office in Mexico that uh, works closely with the Mexican Secretary of Health. 
and on many number of projects. One of them, uh, Yetza is participating, is to assess the mobility of farm workers and other immigrants coming from uh, from Central America and other countries through Mexico to the uh, uh, to the U.S. And another major collaboration is a binational technical working group. So I think there is a historic, uh, very very strong collaboration. So with more to do. Uh, uh, but I think those are some examples of good, good uh, you know, cutting collaboration with some of the other major players in the border region. Are you? Uh, may I just ask if you're also uh, working with Pajo in this area? Uh, left with Pajo, this used to be a, a office of uh, a Pajo office of Border Health, uh, but then they they closed the office a number of years ago. Uh, there are collaboration with Pajo more in terms of the. Uh, Mexico, Central America, some of the Central uh, Mexico, Central American uh, uh, activities, but less right now in terms of the of the border that I am aware of. Thank you. So. so I would like to go back to the second of the three questions that was asked, uh, um, touching on the question about which of the migrant populations do we think is most important, and I would say there is a very good question that you're asking. You know, we in the division have always focused on persons crossing international borders. You know, we have a whole part of the division that is focused on travelers, U.S. travelers who are you know, leaving the United States. We have the whole quarantine branch that is focused on uh, arriving travelers from all over the world. So these are people who have crossed an international border to get into the United States. And then finally, you know, we have, we in our branch have traditionally focused on US bound refugees and US bound immigrants clearly uh, coming across an international border. Uh, so I would say of the migrant groups that we've listed in the conclusion slide, I would say maybe our first focused population of migrants is those that are crossing an international border to come into the United States. Um, you know, we don't have, infinite resources, and I know that we will have to prioritize, but, um, you know, this outbreak has really, you know, pointed to areas that we have not traditionally focused on as being, you know, gaps uh, that Alfonso and his um, cooperative agreement partners have are really trying to fill, and, you know, we're extremely excited and proud of the work that uh, his, his uh, partners have been able to do and accomplish and would love to not see those um, advances go away with, with funding going away. And then finally, on the question about health equity, I was thinking about, you know, where have we focused on health equity? And I think one of the greatest examples of uh, what we've done in health equity is the vaccine program. You know, the vaccine program has uh, brought the U.S. bound uh, refugees on par with um, U.S. children and adults as far as vaccination is concerned. And in fact, we have a surveillance program or, or the states um, with whom we partner do surveillance on number of people vaccinated. And um, so we have partners who can peek into a dashboard and look at, you know, 10 states comparison of uh, refugee vaccination rates for hepatitis versus local population vaccinate. And, you know, in, as a result of this vaccination program, we're, we're doing as better if, as well as, if not better in some circumstances than some of the U.S. found, some of the U.S. populations. So I think that is a really good example of, um, you know, how very, you know, discreet example of how we have focused on yeah, this is, goal. Uh, Alfonso here, I just want to mention something else. Uh, right now through the CDC, we have a very, very strong focus on health equity issue uh, across all the different centers. But also I want to uh, propose that we not only think about equity and outcomes, but also something we are really focusing with Emily and others in our team and across the CDC is equity and, and data collection and participation in data collection. Uh, communities are not uh, included in our data systems and our routine public health data systems don't exist, are invisible. And therefore, they will be unlikely to receive the benefits to be addressed to identify their needs and disparities, and uh, and to uh, the needs to be to be addressed. Right now, most of our surveillance systems uh, do not collect country of birth, do not collect uh, uh, you know immigration status, do not collect language, and they are conducted only in English. 
uh, our communities, uh, the majority are limited English proficient uh, foreign born. Uh, so that's a major, major gap because our policies, our national policies, interventions, uh, and monitoring of the burden of, uh, of COVID-19 in this case, and across most other diseases, completely make uh, these refugee immigrant populations uh, invisible. So I think that's one of the major challenges. If you don't have that, then everything below that kind of falls through the, through the cracks. We have been able to get some funding uh, focus on this population because we have been crying, you know, uh, from the beginning of the pandemic and because of our state and local partner have been every, in every emergency is always a call from a state department. What do we do with migrants, right? And we never will in the U.S. We never be able to respond to that properly, I think, until this year. But it's still there, you know, a long way to go uh, to continue doing that and to continue with our leadership. Uh, and to do it in, a, in, 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 in the, in an appropriate to the need of this uh, very large population. We're talking about 40 plus million uh, refugee immigrant migrants in the U.S. Yeah, if I can just add one one quick thing to that, I I will say that what we've learned throughout this pandemic is that uh, communities have different needs. Communities have different uh, resources, and even the way that. Um, our system and our touch points into different communities, it varies whether you're a refugee or an immigrant. And one of the things I think that we've learned through the, the, the National Resource Center for Refugees, Immigrants and Migrants is really about the hyper-local. And that's been really um, hard to, to, to think about as a federal level where we usually think, see things at the 40,000 foot view. Um, but a lot of the inf interventions and the most successful uh, work that we've done is with uh, just going directly into the communities and being able to say, okay, look, we want you to work on a vaccination campaign that makes sense to you and your your community. Um, you know, here's here's some basic information that we have, but let's let's see what resonates and what makes sense for for your community and what you think is the best way forward. And so, it, in terms of thinking health equity, it's been sometimes daunting to figure out how. Uh, we we t tackle things at that hyper local level, but um, as Alfonso has highlighted and, and Nina as well, it's really about the partnerships and being able to work through those uh, to help us with um, you know kind of tack tackling the larger health equity issue. Over. Let me let me go to Stephen, and then I'm going to ask after S Stephen gets his question answered. Um, I want to catch Marty before he has to go. So Stephen. Yeah, thanks very much. And um, <clears throat> let me just say, Nina, it's good to see you again. And Thank you. Um, uh, thanks for those wonderful presentations, even though I will say I missed the last part of them. I had to drop off for a bit. So I hope I don't ask questions that were covered while I wasn't on. My questions have to do with two groups that my memory from when I was at CDC uh, were very problematic. And one of them is the civil surgeons and the other one is the panel physicians. And uh, my recollection was, you know, at some point we didn't even know who these civil surgeons were. Um, there were no ways to know whether they functioned well or didn't function well. And there were lots of problems back then also with panel physicians. I imagine that <clears throat> some of this has been fixed, but I'm wondering if you have thoughts about uh, those two resources and um, uh, how well they're being they're 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 functioning and whether or not you do any evaluations to be able to say whether or not they're actually doing the things that you want them to be doing and i say part of this because they're selected at least the panel positions are selected by department of state not by cdc and so if they're selected by the department of state there are other motivations in terms of who gets selected as panel physicians um uh not necessarily the ideal ones that cdc would think should be uh, chosen. Um, should that be a responsibility of CDC rather than of the Department of State? And then the last question I have is about the overseas locations, the ones in Kenya and Thailand, which seem to cover vast swaths of the planet. Um, and I believe that they're probably there because that's where CDC had set up their emerging infection program, overseas programs initially. Um, should there be more of them? Um, you know, do you think there would be value to them having um, uh, better coverage? 
All right, let me, uh, the first question, I'm smiling because we have an entire team headed by Drew, Drew Posey, whose precise job is to handle the panels and the civil surgeon. So I'm gonna turn the question over to Drew. All right, thank you, Nina, and wonderful question. Um, Nina, early in the presentation, made an allusion to a change we made in the overseas screening requirements in 2007 to add TB cultures and directly observed therapy to the requirements. One of the things that did or was required in order to achieve that is we have had uh, a tremendous amount of engagement with the panel physicians during those years subsequent to that. Um, our team grew. A lot more site visits overseas. We grew from scratch, a large and comprehensive training program. Uh, we began collecting data on their tuberculosis uh, figures. And we've actually seen uh, a couple waves of significant panel physician roster turnover as we worked to put in place modern TB diagnostics and treatment and cultivate and train a great panel physician workforce. One of the ways that that paid dividends, that I think I failed to mention our H2A testing pilot in Mexico was actually done by one of the panel physician groups in Mexico. Early on, they developed the cap capability in-house uh, for their local populations to do COVID testing and branched out to locations in Tijuana and Monterey, which is where the majority of the H2A's workers enter the United States and we're able to be our, our main implementing partner for the, uh, that particular pilot as just an example of building off uh, some of the great work and knowledge and capabilities they've developed over the last 10 to 15 years. For civil surgeons, that has, is coming a little later. We have become much more involved with them on training and education over the last three to four years. We have worked extensively with USCIS who holds the authority over designating them. We have now developed, um, through working with CIS, our own panel physician roster and email distribution list to serve as a mechanism for us to be able to communicate with them. Uh, we've seen excellent turnout with the training activities that we've done. That is uh, not as far along as the panel physician work. The panel physician program had a head start but we are moving in a similar direction of much greater engagement. USCIS is looking at doing a regulatory change. Can I just ask CIS yes. being Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services is a part of Department of Homeland Security. Uh, so you and, don't select them either. Correct. And USCIS is working on updating their regulations on uh, their authority for civil surgeons that will make it a little more rigorous. Um, and that's come about through a long-term engagement with CIS to try to manage these populations or manage the physicians. And maybe I should pose the question to Marty, is would it make sense for CDC to select these rather than somebody else? Short answer is yes. Both, and the consequence of having the selection and the forms, the literal regulatory data structures owned by state on one hand and DHS on the other hand, has been, as, as you alluded to, not necessarily in aligned and in sync and in pace with the kind of public health, both examinations, the quality of those things, the licensing, et cetera, but also with the um, ability for the data collection and regulatory. You've heard a lot about data needs and movement and having a compatible electronic health record that applies in multiple circumstances. So I think both of those would be better served by um, the public health side having, uh, and, and as you may remember, Steve, historically there were U.S. public health service officers, I mean, going way back in this role. And when the, when the foreign quarantine service was reduced in size and then moved to CDC through the big rift in 1967, uh, those were essentially outsourced to the agencies with the footprint. Well, while we've got you there, Marty, um, I know Larry had a, Gosson had a question. You're muted, Larry. I'm muted, yes, I realized, yeah. Hi, Marty, how are you? Um, 
So Marty, you know, if, you know, throughout the years, um, you know, you've been at this for a long time, but most of what you've done, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, was, um, you know, for tuberculosis and other kinds of screenings. And is the, and COVID has been, seems to me, a whole new level of challenge um, for you. So I wondered, you know, could you talk, a, you know, obviously funding is an issue, I realize that, but can you talk about, you know, whether CDC is fit for purpose for managing a huge global pandemic like this? Okay. And if, and what, it, what you think you need to actually um, a, a comp, you know, be better prepared, I mean, and very well prepared for the next health crisis? Yeah, I will, I will say maybe some exception to your first observation, I think that Nina's group, um, you know, as she described the, the activities today, had a big TB focus because TB in the foreign born made up a disproportionate burden. Um, and, and that's the case. Yeah, but the, I, the, I use that as an example because wasn't TB the only actual quarantine um, that, that? No, I, I see what you're, you're talking about, the 07 yeah. uh, incident yeah. from Atlanta. Yeah. No, I, I think we generally had developed a regulatory framework that evolved in my 25 years here to modernize it, um, but we hadn't had it exercised by a pandemic. And to that extent, yes, the greatest use of federal authorities for actual isolation um, and quarantine had been focused around TB, not scaled, although the planning aspects were there, the operation and implementation and the use of regulatory authority to control a, you know, a once in a century up till now kind of pandemic is not, is, was not, and we've learned a lot from that. I would say that um, as a division, we've built out capacity over these 25 years in multiple arenas, both uh, the traveler, the expatriate health side. I mean, the principle has been that migration is both unidirectional for resettlement, but also circular, and that the health of migrants by working on the health of migrants, we actually address the larger issues of um, preventing importation and spread because they're because of the disparities and the disproportionate impact of introduction and spread that comes with, with movement and vulnerable populations. And by the way, that includes the globalization of animals and cargo as well. I think what you are hitting on is the, the three things I, I wanted to mention it as themes for the committee to, to digest a bit is that what we've seen, what we've seen because of COVID, have really opened our eyes to the continuation of trends and the the prescience of the original EI report uh, that Joshua Letterberg's committee, you know, issued in '92, and that is the um, the drivers of of pandemics have not gotten any not gotten any oh. less; they've just accelerated. Or the, lateness to blame. Oh, hey, so. Oh, sorry. Um, and, and we, what we're now seeing is, uh, you know, the sort of the, the fruitful forecasting of what global, the frequency of these types of global events, the complexity and the, the duration of a, of a pandemic like COVID where we're into two years and from a global perspective, we have a longer way to go, uh, is creating syndemics in which all of the other issues that the division faces are exaggerated. Irregular migration, one of the big drivers there has been um, the economic hardship in addition to um, conflict and, and strife and sort of gang violence and, and climate change, quite frankly. But the drivers of these of, of dis forced displacement and opportunistic displacement and the economic hardships that are consequences of pandemic and the health disparities that, that come as a result of the inequity that we've been living with for a long time are just magnified. The scale is also getting much, much larger. Not only is the interval shorter, but the scale of these responses is larger. So the Southwest border response that you heard about is the largest um, land crossing irregular migration um, that's occurred um, to our knowledge in US history. And simply the reversal of the policy in January when the administration changed of taking down uh, Title 42 partially to allow unaccompanied children in I think the numbers don't quote me on the precision of this, but it's in the range of 140,000 
unaccompanied child arrivals that were admitted sort of post January of 2021, 100,000 of which have been successfully resettled with, with parents or family members or permanent you know, adopted homes. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous accomplishment, but all that has to be done in the setting of a pandemic, in the, in the use of isolation, quarantine, infection control, phasing in uh, treatments when they're available, vaccination, considering stresses on healthcare systems. That's, a, that's, that's been an, a massive effort over the last 11 months. Um, and that still isn't in place for the other two large populations, which are crossing the border that, that DHS is encountering uh, in terms of family units, as well as um, single adults seeking asylum. And those complex migration streams are very mixed in terms of forced and opportunity and all sorts of age groups and demographics, as well as mixed in countries of origin and mixed in risk factors as, and, and disease burdens. Um, and certainly those things have to be addressed at a scale that's unprecedented. And then finally, the conflict situations that we're seeing around the globe, the unrest, the violence that are also in many ways magnified and amplified by both disparities and, and mother nature's pandemics are driving the kind of crisis that we saw in Afghanistan. That too was at an unprecedented scale. So since August, over 100,000 Afghani evacuees have arrived, and it's projected that we're going to see, you know, a need for accommodating similar volumes in the next fiscal, in, in FY22 as a year ahead, um, or possibly that. And that's just one location. So I think what you've alluded to, Larry, is are, are we prepared for the reality of what we're facing, potentially new pandemics, mass migration emergencies, forced displacement, um, all of these things, and that's aside from sort of the climate-driven migration. No, we're not, we're not prepared for this in a way that we should, and it really needs some healthy reflection on, it's not just um, you know, that there are things that can be just done the same way, but scaled as Lonnie brought before, there are new leveraged relationships that must occur. There are changes in regulation. There are changes in data collection systems. We need real time, faster ways to be responsive to these things. And we need better communication tools that you know, recognize the fact that we're not communicating to a monolithic single, whether it's linguistically, culturally, ethnically, or uh, of, you know, of certain types of belief structures we just have to be better in a lot of these spaces. And this division is, you know, by the nature of what we do is kind of in the middle of a lot of that, that crossfire, you know, between the pathogen, the hosts and the milieu in the context of emerging threats. Um, we are seen as a, as a nexus place for, for a first go-to for building this out, but it's, it's not big enough. It's not fast enough. And it needs um, some, you know, real thought about how we do this, uh, more efficiently in order to be prepared for even finishing this pandemic, much less the next one. You know, I hope that I've given you just some context of the environment that we've been operating in over sort of my 25 years in, in this role. Thank you, Marty. I know you had a hard stop. So um... yeah, I'll be happy to, if there are things that come up later, uh, George is happy to engage with the committee as, as they request. But we really, I'm very grateful for all the expertise that's on this panel, and I'm, I'm, I'm not only grateful in advance, but extremely, uh, you know, looking forward to the help that the committee can provide in, in getting to exactly the question that you asked, Larry, and, and that we've all been asking ourselves over time. Thank you. I'm going to go in this order: is Lonnie, Michelle, and and uh, uh, Jason, and then I don't know if Ed or Brad. Did you guys had your hands up? Did you, you brought them back down? You got your questions answered. All set. Okay. So Lonnie, Michelle, um, and uh, Jason. Okay, well, thanks, uh, Georges, and uh, thanks to all the presenters. It was really helpful and informative and, uh, and appreciative. And Nina, thank you. It's good to see you again uh, after a long and time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my question, uh, really, you guys are doing so much, and more is added on your plate seemingly all the time. Um, my question goes to how do you measure performance? So you, know, you talked about this continuity of care, which is a good, I think a good way to think about this, but um, what kind of information do you get from uh, after migrants or, or refugees at Emirates Command 
uh, to follow their health uh, six months into the United States or longer, uh, realizing that local and state health are also under real extreme burdens as well. But if we knew you know, what kinds of outcomes were taking place after folks were in this country for a while and understood that, that might really inform you in terms of what you're doing at the front end and help you focus and maybe change kinds of um, the ways you do things. Thanks. Um, I'd love to respond to that if, you have, if there's Oh, absolutely. Time. Okay. Um, we actually had a performance measure several years ago, it was put in as part of, um, of government accountability, you know, how does, how does our branch measure itself? And one of the performance measures was TB outcomes in recently arrived refugees, and migrants, which is exactly the question, Lonnie, that you're asking, you know, what happens to people after 90 days, after, you know, after the first 90 days? And so uh, the, the second part of what you said is very true. We have had a lot of difficulty tracking that metric because health departments simply do not have the wherewithal to send back the TB um, outcome form that we ask them. So we have a database that, where we send them all of the records and we ask for them to fill out a form on each case, to say, what happened to this person? Did this person really have TB? You know, was he really, how did it all work out? And the return rate on those forms is actually quite low. And the reason is because health departments simply do not have the staffing to track those outcomes. So one way we have um, tried, we are trying to do it business a little bit differently on that regard is to uh, actually work with um, the Division of Tuberculosis Elimination on a project to uh, take our data and match it with state, um, literally match the personal identifying information of t outcomes of TB cases uh, in select states that do have the capacity. So it will be done more as a research project than as a surveillance project. Um, so it, it is something we would love to see more of and we would, you know, we can get in a long discussion about how to help states with tuberculosis, but clearly there is a lot more help um, that they need, um, particularly in times like this where they're all diverted to something else and all of our state refugee health coordinators are off doing COVID response. So uh, it, we're really struggling right now. Thank you. Michelle. So um, I'm unmuted. Thank you. Thank you very much for a great presentation. My, my question has to do with collaboration because um, you're generating a tremendous amount of data now, much more than you have in the past. Um, will you be interfacing with the new center um, for forecasting and outbreaks uh, to help you with some of the data analytics? Um, the second question is collaboration. <coughs> uh, you mentioned that you need a data sharing agreement with some of the federal agencies. Um, what agencies are that, or are they that um, we can maybe help you with? And the third and fourth questions are, the third question is, um, I know the folks that have been out in Kenya, they've been great, but we have a new um, Kenya CDC, uh, not Kenya, Africa CDC that's starting. Are you collaborating? with the new Africa CDC, because they need a lot of help. They're just really taking off. And then the fourth question, are you collaborating with the global health security agenda or is that sort of a dead issue? All Sorry. right, I, I um, you. yes, <laughs> you're at, good question. You know, the data and analytics center, uh, we have just learned about it and we would be very excited to learn more. We have, I, I don't, Marty may have mentioned uh, during the course of these sessions that we have something called Innovation, data evaluation, and analytics. It's a it's a unit within Marty's uh, group, headed by a lady named Ardif Grills, who actually comes from um, military background, um, and they do a lot of data mining of real large data sets, like aviation data sets and so forth. Um, so they probably are sort of like a mini data analytics group, and they've been very helpful to us. But uh, we would love to learn more about this new center and uh, not to tread on Ardith's toes because I'm sure Ardith and her group will take the lead in our division for becoming the liaisons. But yes, we would be very interested in, uh, share, in sharing and learning how 
uh, pulling from what they can provide could potentially help us do our job better. Um, so the second question is you asked specifically, well, the one that is really hot on our list is the um, US Customs and Immigration Service of DHS uh, with whom we are trying to put data sharing agreements in place. Another agency is the Office of Refugee Resettlement, um, the unaccompanied, well, actually the Refugee Division and the Unaccompanied Children Division. Uh, here on the Unaccompanied Children side, uh, we wanted to do a project around um, strain surveillance and you know, looking at what uh, Delta, was Delta circulating in these shelters. And we found that we had no data sharing agreement and could not even embark on a protocol without having, and that has taken a long, long time. So it, it really hit us that, you know, the, those agreements should have been in place. And, you know, why do we not have those agreements in place? Then your next question about Africa CDC and actually the global health, those two questions really pertain, I, I, think I mentioned in our slides about the global border health team, which is a new team in our branch that came to us actually from the quarantine branch in 2018. And this border health team is, is, exists to help ministries of health understand what is happening with public health around their borders. And it really hit home with, you know, spread of, of Ebola when it, people realized, well, yeah, you can get Ebola by getting onto an airplane, but the way they really got Ebola was simply by moving from Sierra Leone to Liberia across the footbridge. Yep. So we are supporting Africa CDC through global health security funding. Uh, we are actually uh, paying for a position at Africa CDC for a border health specialist um, to serve their region. I realize that's just a small thing, but yes, uh, we are um, very tied in through that border health team to the global health security agenda. And just a quickie follow-up. I know that there hasn't been enough money going to CDC for these overseas offices. Is that still happening? Uh, well, I would say definitely in the case of our two, uh, mm -hmm. they are, uh, you know, Steve had asked earlier, you know, do we need more of them? And um, we need to stabilize funding for the two that we have. They're expensive to run. The reason we have them in Thailand is, and Kenya is not only because of the CDC offices, but because they both represented the countries from which the leading edge of refugee resettlement from the region was centered around. In Nairobi, they have all the major UNHCR, all the major players are for East Africa are in Nairobi and the same is true in Thailand. So um, in 2016, I'll just say very quickly, we uh, took uh, some money, one of our staff members, Heather Burke, and put her in, we embedded her in IOM in Amman, Jordan um, to face the Syrian resettlement. And then the Syrian resettlement didn't really happen, but she was embedded there for four years. Um, and so we, we do not have that position anymore, but one area we are really looking at closely now is the CDC regional coordinating, coordinating offices. Uh, there's talk of opening the Central America office, and we are really thinking about putting in a proposal to put a direct hire CDC staff uh, for migration health expertise in that Central America office. Uh, so- Thank you. Yeah. Trying to answer your question, Nancy. Oh, you did. Thank you. Jason. Uh, yes. Uh, th thank you, Lena, Emily, Alfonso, and Drew. And I, I have a question about uh, something I heard in the presentation, which is that you, it was mentioned that you cannot require seasonal farm workers to be vaccinated before entry to the United States. Why is that? So, uh, the time uh, of entries. You, Sorry. So they, okay. Um, so right now, and Drew, you need to help me with this. Right now, um, the air travelers are required to be vaccinated. Land border requirements are not the same. Is that correct, Drew? Sure. So what that was referring to, uh, especially at the time we were uh, struggling with what to do for that population, because the that pilot occurred from February through April, but the work trying to do something and put it together began in the summer of 2020. And at its root is uh, persons applying for a non-immigrant visa to the United States 
are not routinely required to have a medical exam, meaning the, Depart there's, the Department of State feels, and, and we've had a lot of discussions with them through the years about this, that, that no one has the regulatory authority to require whole populations of non-immigrant visa applicants to have a medical examination. A consular officer has individual discretion if, if they see something in the application to require them to see a panel physician. And so there was no way to try to have or incorporate or weave in any type of medical encounter as a part of the visa process to do something like a COVID test right before entry or uh, looking ahead, COVID vaccine. And so uh, we put together our pilot as a voluntary pilot that was done right before entry, uh, in part, not just to learn about COVID, more, learn more about COVID in that group, but to see if it could be done quickly with an eye towards uh, things in the future. Now, recently, as we know, there were updated uh, proclamations and orders regarding COVID-19 testing before travel to the United States and a vaccine requirement for air travelers. Um, I believe some of those may have tried to address uh, land border crossings. Um, there might be others from our division who are on who are more familiar with the specifics of those orders, but it is a little bit of a conundrum that large essential worker populations or, or important groups applying for non-immigrant visas <clears throat> are not subject to a medical exam requirement. We also ran into related to that, and now that we've got the uh, you know, COVID vaccines, which are having such a great effect, the, even if there was a medical exam requirement for non-immigrant visa applicants, the <clears throat> way that the Immigration and Nationality Act was written that established an immunization requirement for immigrants, it's written such that they actually use the term immigrant and the lawyers and official policy memos through the years have always come down and saying <clears throat> that can only be a requirement for immigrants and not refugees or other non-immigrant populations. So that still remains a lo little bit of a gap or a big gap as we think about how to get more people vaccinated um, who may be coming to the United States. So do seasonal, work for the oh, seasonal workers are not immigrants then, right? Not really. In, in, the, in the eyes of U.S. law, they, they are not immigrants. In, in a lay person's sense of, you know, foreign-born people here in the United States, but um, the immigrants specifically in U.S. law are people given an immigrant visa overseas or those in the United States who are applying to adjust their immigration status to a lawful permanent resident. Those are may, the immigrants. May I just follow up? I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Department of Homeland Security um, guidance. And so basically um, it includes all non-citizen travelers um, who are fully vaccinated um, via land ports of entry and ferry terminals, I think, as well as air. Um, and they need to provide proof of vaccination as outlined by CDC. So why is it that there's a regulatory problem, you know, at the point when these groups cross the border, either by land, sea, or air? No, right now, if I may, Alfonso here. So right now, the essential workers are exempted until January. Sometime in January, we don't know, we don't have a date. Mm -hmm. so not required to present proof of vaccination and in January they will need to do that uh, for COVID-19. Now yeah, that, that's not a regulatory problem that's just yeah. an implementation right? Right now I think also the challenge is that even uh, if uh, right now for example in Mexico and probably in other countries of origin of these uh, H2A workers uh, the, the individuals don't have a choice of the type of vaccine that they get. Uh, they, they get a registration they, they only can go to, to one place uh, close to where they live uh, for a specific time and they get the vaccine that they have available. Millions of people in Mexico have been vaccinated with non-FDA, non-WHO uh, approved vaccines. So I think that's another challenge, even though the requirement is going to apply in January, uh, 
even if the age group workers really want to get vaccinated, our concern is that they're going to have a choice to say, I go to the pharmacy in Mexico next door and I ask for a Pfizer because they cannot do that. Uh, so the question is, you know, what, what is going to happen? And we don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think that the current rules require that the vaccine has to be either emergency use listed by WHO or FDA yeah. authorized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how do they do that if they don't have it available? That's yeah. So I, I think what, um, Dr. Gosson, you touched on uh, one of the conundrums we talk about, which is we have these populations coming, even, even if it's our refugees and our vaccine program, which is created in part because they're not subject to the vaccine requirements. So we have to work around that and collaborating with the Department of State to have vaccines. So I guess even though you have the orders and proclamations that require someone showing proof of vaccination or a test, from a best use of regulatory authorities perspective, is it better to have a little bit greater regulatory authority to close some of these gaps as people are coming through the systems and the processes for them versus sort of, uh, I don't know if it's legally correct to say, kind of um, an at the end overarching blanket thing to ensure it right before entry. And, and that's something we debate and struggle with. Mm -hmm. uh, is it better to do it more upstream as they're going through their visa processes or the normal channels versus a stop gap? Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yes, it's Another, upstream is good. And I think I see your dilemma entirely. Yeah. Another opportunity is maybe something like Canada in the Mexico, they have a, a program for seasonal agricultural workers going to Canada. It's, been not, it's not perfect, but it's been, uh, both sides are very happy and uh, avoids uh, the situation that is right now in Mexico that is an uh, unregulated number of recruiters uh, recruiting these workers. There is a lot of abuse and being charged, uh, uh, et cetera. And the Mexican government doesn't even have any control. They're very interested in working with us. They tried to have a, a MOU a number of years ago than ever to have something like Canada, they have with Canada. That could be another possibility that will be kind of part of a you know, collaborative, collaborative, you know, uh, a program for to have the uh, medical examinations that would in, in, in Mexico for the workers uh, and uh, or complying with other uh, joint uh, recommendations or requirement from the, both the U.S. And, and Mexico. That could be another, I think, another opportunity or model to look at. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify something on the vaccine requirements that I think might be causing confusion. So I believe Drew was talking about our authorities under um, 40, uh, Section 34, which applied to the immigrant medical exam, which is specific to immigrants. And then we have additional authorities under Part 71, which have to do with people traveling internationally. And right now, under Part 71, we don't have any regulations that require that can require vaccination so uh, there was a presidential proclamation that people had to be vaccinated when they were traveling internationally and we use that to apply to international travelers but that's something that could be considered for updating our regulatory authorities would be whether we add something that says we can require vaccination for certain circumstances um, for people coming in uh, crossing the international border. So I just wanted to, to clarify that maybe, maybe a little bit. Yeah, thank, that's thank you. Yeah. So actually, uh, this, was the, this was around the question that I was gonna ask earlier, George. So, but, uh, so under um, the INA, the president has the ability to exclude any people group or threat that deems necessary to the country, uh, which has been used, maybe overused uh, recently. But uh, under that, it does seem that there's the, uh, the ability to require folks to be vaccinated. And I believe that's the authority that's being used, the base story that's being used right now for the, the current actions. And uh, it shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't matter whether it's air or land border. But again, that requires people to be vaccinated. You still have the other, the attendant problems of uh, immigrants or, uh, or even, uh, you know, Travelers to the United States may not have access to a to an approved vaccine. Yeah, good point. Good point. Any any final questions for our colleagues from CDC?
Okay. Let me let me thank you very much. Again, that was very, very informative. Um, I think we're now gonna go into a closed session. I wanna, um, um, should we just do a five minute break or 10 minutes? Yeah, why don't we go till at least three o'clock? Okay, so we'll, we'll, re we'll reconvene at, ten, at, at uh, three o'clock, 3 p.m. Thank you so much for letting us present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.